Now, I'm delighted to be joined on the line by Labour TD for Dublin Bay North, Aon Oreiron, and by actor Gary Cook as well, because we're taking a walking football tour of Dublin tonight, as the two of them have started this sort of walking tour of North Dublin, I would say, because it, it starts in the Clonliffe Road and ends in Daly Mount Park. Aon and Gary, you're very welcome along. Thanks for joining me tonight. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? So... Tell us a little bit about this first. How did it come about? Why did you start doing this? And sort of what's what's the motive behind this? Why did you want to bring the history of football in Dublin to life? Um, I suppose if you go back to August, um, a lot of us were, were spending a lot of time at home going through sort of boxes in our attics and stuff. And I have a big interest in football. So I was going through a lot of my football program collections. And um, I know Gary. And Gary, uh, the entertainment industry was, was basically halted overnight because of the pandemic so uh his interest in football and my interest in football and our collective interest in, in history kind of uh, made us start thinking about what we could do practically you know and uh, we had an idea of doing a football walking tour uh, of dublin um from from crow park uh, to daily mount park uh, just as a one-off uh, at the end of august to see if there'd be interest in it and uh, really to get people out of their houses because people aren't going to matches and they're, and they're really looking for something to do. And we just we decided to do one in on August 22nd and we had such incredible interest in it and hundreds of people emailing me uh, and emailing us uh, was that it's it's still going. And we've taken obviously a break since, uh, since January and we're just back up running again now. But the level of interest is absolutely astounding. And it's all really about the conflict between effectively soccer and GA over the last 100 years or so and a huge amount of the history of that conflict or that tension between the two games uh, and the political context around it features heavily in that area of of the north inner city in Clonaf Road um, uh, area and uh, and we enjoy it. Yeah and Gary a lot of people would know you from Apri Match and from your comedic work as well but what what was it got you into this why did you say yes to Aon when I asked you about it? Uh, because you never say no to Aon, really. I realised that <laughs> you might come across as a nice guy, but really, um, no. I, I just, for for the same reason, I suppose, as, as Aon is saying, I was, you know, I'm interested in in, in football, uh, and I'm interested in sport generally. I'm also interested in history, and and I did a little bit of tour guiding as well, uh, actually, as a as a as a kind of part time job as well, in a place called the Little Museum in Dublin. Um, so I was, you know, the three things. Kind of led me to, to to think it was a good idea, and it it is a good idea, and it kind of, it kind of taps into a certain, you know, it it, it taps into a dare I say it, uh, uh, the civil war politics in a way in this country, and it's so much tied in with the uh, with with the war of independence, uh, the two sports and their histories, as you know. Mm. Uh, so the whole thing just interested me. Yeah, yeah well, you're speaking to a, a sport and history. Not so. I, the only reason I wanted to get you on was because I, I didn't want to pay for the tour. I just wanted to get it for free. So we'll we'll start with no, the Gary tour is going to be one. Gary is going to be one of these guys who's going to contradict us. He said no, that wasn't eighteen sixty seven. It was eighteen sixty eight. How dare uh, you? Uh, hang up it the phone. The, the we get letters. Way. We get letters. You know, we do. We get emails. <laughs> we get letters written in green ink saying hmm, you didn't mention such and such or such and such an event. Anyway, yeah, no, it's yeah. it's uh, uh, it's fascinating because in a way, Crow Park. And I used to represent that area politically. Um, but the first time I ran for election was in the North Inner City, 2004. And Crow Park is almost like an alien spaceship in a soccer area. And, and that sort of tension or, or, or friction has always really fascinated me. So there's a huge number of Irish soccer internationals from that immediate area. Um, but there wouldn't really be the same number of, uh, of, of famed GA players. Um, and that sort of uh, official Ireland view of soccer in the early years of the state is something that we both uh, are fascinated by. The idea of these uh, of an Irish soccer team trying to bring honours to the country all over the world, but yet despised by a huge number of people in Ireland at the same time, um, is something that it might be very unusual to younger people, but it's something that probably we would be more uh, aware of um, you know, as we were growing up. Mm. Um, yeah, we did a piece. Uh, it was a sort of a series at the start of the lockdown, the first lockdown with Paul Rouse, the historian mm. from UCD, mm. and he discussed the diff the the different variations and almost the complexity of this situation because the GAA has, in some ways, whitewashed all of the good that soccer has done in Dublin and how how much it actually was loved 
so can we, can we start with the Clonliffe Road and around that area? Because I think yeah. that's where the heart of football, I play football for Drumcondra. So I, I train in O'Connell School, which to me is an amazing place to train because you have Crow Park in the background, but it is soccer heartland of Dublin. Yeah, well, we started at the junction there, Clonliffe Road and, and the Ballybuck Road, and we just kind of give an indication of all the soccer internationals who are from there. All right, so you have Jack Byrne and um, Curtis Fleming and Wes Houlihan and Troy Parrott and Kenny Cunningham. And we start off talking a little bit about a guy called Paddy Moore who played in the 30s and he played um, for both both Ireland's, if you like. Uh, and he's from um, Clonliffe Avenue. Uh, but he, he dined early because of complications with, with alcohol, but he once scored four goals in the World Cup qualifier against Belgium in 1934, which was a record and still is a record for an Irish international. Um, but the stadium is only in GA ownership from 1913. And uh, we talk about the history of the games coming to Ireland, effectively the IRFU and, and, and the IFA were established 1879 and, and 1880. And they were very Belfast orientated. So when the GA came along, um, it probably had a wider spread, but it was all around that era of games being formalized, rules being laid down, written down. Uh, but from the off, the GA was very much uh, a focus for, for the IRB and, and for infiltration by the IRB. And, and Gary touches on that as we as we walk around, because the very next stop as we walk around is down to to, to Tom Clark's house where, where he lived in, on Richmond Road. So do you want to take us through that, Gary, a little bit, that history? Uh, well, um, the... The, the history of 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 which part of it, sorry. So uh, as you move along towards the Tom Clark uh, house and the history of the IRB and GAA and how all that mixed together with soccer. Well, I think uh, this is the part that Aon does, actually, <laughs> so he should do it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm like the spoofer in the, in the in exam. Gary Cook, he's a spoofer. That's all he is. He doesn't know the history. This guy does. This is his part, so I'll let him say. He'll tell yeah. us. Well, but that, that, that area that around Fairview Marino, where people are aware of it, like it was a hotbed of political activity in the, um, you know, 100 years ago. So the IRB, or sorry, the, the Irish Volunteers would have trained uh, at the rear of Fairview Church. The um, Irish Citizens Army would have drilled um, further down in Marino beside Cor- uh, Corrigan House. And it's interesting, like, <clears throat> there was a, an interface at a League of Ireland match in 1913, around the time of the lockout. And there was a baton charge, famously on Collins Street in 1913, over uh, uh, an appearance by Larkin or a, a a expected appearance by Larkin uh, over around that weekend when everything's getting hot and heavy. But it was it was Larkin who 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 demanded that um, the striking workers would would uh, uh, picket protest uh, a, a shells bows game because he said that there was a, a scab playing on both on both on both teams. So it's kind of interesting when when it comes to the sort of the the lockout struggle, the the main sporting fixture. Uh, that was at the heart of that uh, was, uh, was, a, was, a, was a soccer game. But when it came to the, the War of Independence, the main sporting six, fixture, if you like, that was at the heart of that, uh, of that struggle was, was a GEA game. Um, but uh, uh, you know, as Gary would say, when, when we're down at Tom Clark's house and, and we're speaking about all the people he would have been, been involved with, you know, not every uh, GA person was, was a rabid Republican and not every so- soccer player had a different political identity. It, like... Yeah. Um, Oscar, Oscar trainer. trainer, yeah, I was a goalkeeper for Belfast Celtic, uh, and uh, uh, Carl Brewer actually played uh, cricket. Uh, and well, so what's interesting about Croke Park as well is you know soccer was played there, uh, but you know before the ban and all that uh, at the beginning, and cricket was played there even as well. Uh, and and my understanding of it is that uh, you know Michael Cusack himself is a cricket fan and had. You know, had they had to make a decision about whether cricket would be part of the GAA or not, you know, because there were so many clubs. So this is a kind of history that a lot of people aren't really aware of. And uh, I find it I, I find it uh, particularly fascinating. Uh, Eamon de Valera himself, of course, said, um, I think about rugby that it, in Black Rock, he went to Black Rock. Uh, it was a game that most suited the Irish uh, temperament as well. And uh, what, what I find interesting, I suppose, what you both do is, is the idea as well that you know, the, the, the Jesuit schools promoted, you know, rugby uh, and the Christian Brothers schools promoted uh, GAA and soccer is and always kind of was, uh, as I say, educationally harmless uh, <laughs> uh, is. Uh, and and that, that it's, it's, that, it's that kind of lesser, uh, lesser citizen sort of status that soccer mm-hmm. has that particularly interests me. And I know 
Eamon Dunphy himself, himself has talked about it a lot when he talks about it in, in, uh, in his book. Uh, and, you know, uh, as he says, you know, we are, we are, we are spat at, you know, <laughs> and like it wasn't part of official Ireland soccer. Mm. And um, it, uh, it, it, it's, so it's, it's, it's got that, it's got that, that, that sort of of the people sense of it, you know, uh, from the ground up kind of vibe, I think soccer, you know, where f- we, we, we've got to say soccer and delineate between soccer and football as well, because obviously they're, <laughs> They're the same thing, but they're two different things. <laughs> it's just, it's just funny, but uh, anyway, so 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 it's so so yeah, uh, yeah, and then we kind of we move down, just uh, then Richmond Road down down to Stella Maris, and Stella Maris is a, a great underage club and has a, a little wall there in Stella Maris uh, Football Club and has all the list of ex internationals who play for it, and one of them obviously is John Giles, and and, and we focus a bit on John because. Um, you know the fact that he felt not even Irish when he left because mm. uh, left Ireland because the Christian brothers were were pushing this this sort of official Ireland view of uh, of what it meant to be Irish and I we get the sense that and I get the sense maybe from my own um, you know family that a lot of these Christian brothers in the early years of the state were pro- probably from the country probably in Dublin, not really happy to be in Dublin, teaching kids they didn't understand, who played games that they didn't understand, you know, living in states that they didn't get their, couldn't get their head around because they're, you know, and everything being pushed by official Ireland was, you know, Peg on Tillanoch, this kind of idolised view of, of, of the Irish condition. And and these these urban street kids just didn't fit it. And, you know, Giles talks about being a, a, called a, a corner boy, who goes up to Dalyman Park and, and going to Dalyman Park as a corner boy was was like the, the, the worst description that a teacher could give you. And so he heads off to to England and as a as a teenager, as a 14, 15 year old, not even feeling Irish, mm. which is which is a remarkable dynamic, you know. So we touch on that and and um, we bring a bit of fun into it because you know Owen Hand was a was a uh, was involved with Stella Maris as well, and um, he uh, he obviously took over from Giles as manager, and um, we uh, we tell the story about how Owen Hand apparently only became Ireland manager, uh, winning a vote over Paddy Mulligan by one vote because an FBI official uh, was convinced that Paddy Mulligan had thrown a bun at him on a bus, and that's how he won the mm. uh, the <laughs> that's how he won the job. But uh, bun, we bring all those bun, we, those bun, stories into it. Yeah, bun. yeah, yeah, bun, bun, the bun, not a bun, but um. But Gary does his, does his John Giles bit because you know that's really why he's there. You know, is to is to bring the, uh, the bring the voices along. <laughs> I was involved in getting a plaque put up to him from where he's from in um, in Ormond Square, uh, and it's remarkable the day that we unveiled it, the the level of of, of affection that he's held in. Mm. But he, he lives a life where he can't walk five yards when he's some people approach him and sort of you know almost genuflect in front of him. You know. Um, but yeah, uh, his story and what he says in his book about about the way he was treated uh, as a kid in school, and there's a lot of that uh, through the tour about the school and how schools viewed um, viewed soccer, because and and still to, to an extent, not to a large extent, but to an extent, soccer just isn't the game that. Um, knits in with the Irish education system. Mm. Uh, other sc- schools will identify themselves, as Gary said, as rugby schools or as GA schools, but there's very few schools which would kind of face the world or, or, or show themselves to the world being identified as being soccer schools. And that's part, that's, that's one of the things that, that uh, I think the soccer community has to, has to address. And it came up in one of the tours, uh, yeah. Gary, Gary will remember. Yeah, Noel King was on the tour, and uh, he was—he'd uh, worked for the FAI, I think, and mm. uh, he was very. I mean, you could really hear it in his voice. You know, he—he he, he was pretty annoyed about the fact that he, he found it very difficult dealing with some of the GA, with the with the GA schools in relation to getting soccer into them, and and that there was, you know, he believed that you know you should be of a choice to play both in schools, and, and in many respects, he's right, of course. You should be able to play anything in schools, and I don't like the politics of any sport in this country because I had far too much of it when I was growing up. You know, mm-hmm. soccer was for the lower class, and you play rugby because you're middle class, and it really annoyed me hugely. So I can understand where he's coming from, um, but uh, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was kind of venting his frustration <laughs> as if as if Aon himself was personally responsible. It's quite funny. 
but he was great. He was very interesting and great. You know, and uh, uh, it, it's uh, and, we, and we get we get great people on the tours. Like we got Mickey Whelan on the tour. We got Turtle O'Connor uh, uh, Turtle O'Connor on the tour. Mickey Whelan told a great story about the vigilance committee that used to stand outside these you know games in Lansdowne Road and and Dataman Park, ticking off names of GA players that that might be attending these matches and all the rest of it. Um, really fascinating stuff. And Mickey Whelan has a has a you know, former Dublin manager and Dublin uh, player, but he has a, a soccer background as well, so he understood the dynamic. You know, mm. so for some people of a certain generation, this is really real to their daily lives. I say for a lot of people, they just they play both games and hope to be under the radar a little bit. But this intense rivalry between Christian brother schools comes out a lot, especially when we tell tell the Liam Brady story. So we go we go from from um, from Stella Maris, we go down to Talker Park, uh, and that is a Talker Park is a, obviously. It's a live discussion as to what the future talk of Park is. But we talk about, because Eamon comes from across the house facing Katalka Park. So we talk about beyond there is Clontork Park. And Clontork Park is where the original um, All Irelands were played in the 1890s. And one guy called uh, Jack Kirwan actually won an All Ireland with Dublin in 1896. And then went on to play for Spurs, won an, All- won an FA Cup with Spurs in 1901. And then went on to manage IX Amsterdam. And there's another guy living on, who used to live along Richmond Road called Alex Stevenson, who's one of, the own, one of only five players from what's now the Republic of Ireland to play for Rangers. Um, uh, he played in the 40s. Uh, and then we talk about Con Martin, and Con Martin, who won a, an All Ireland, sorry, a, a Leinster Championship with Dublin in 1941, uh, and then discovered he played for John Condra, that you play for, and they wouldn't give him his medal, and didn't give right. him his medal until 1971. And in the meantime, he, he played for Ireland, the Republic of Ireland uh, against England in Goldson Park, scored a goal, but wasn't considered Irish enough to get his Leinster Championship medal. And then, you know, we talk about the split up of the, FU, of the IFA in 1921, which is 100 years ago, because Shells, who now play in, uh, in Talker Park, were involved in the split because they were uh, due to play a game against Glenavon in a, in a cup semi-final in Belfast uh, around that time. Uh, the game was drawn. The Belfast-orientated IFA um, uh, decided that the replay would again be played in Belfast and Shelburne said, well, that's we're not playing that game. And it was just a, a, the latest of a number of grievances they had against the Belfast kind of orientated uh, IFA. And they formed the FAI with a number of other clubs. And the interesting thing is that from the early 20s to the late 40s, players played for both. The FAI international side didn't have a lot of recognition. It, wasn't, it didn't get internationals against England, Scotland or, Scotland or Wales. And the IFA still presented this team as being Ireland and selected players from the entire island. So people like Jackie Carey, people like Paddy Moore, we mentioned earlier, um, represented both Ireland's. But 30 players represented both Ireland's uh, until the late 40s, Ireland became a republic and it kind of... UEFA intervened and FIFA intervened and that's where Northern Ireland and the Republic mm. of Ireland kind of settled but Shelburne were at the heart of the, of the split 100 years ago Very interesting I didn't actually know that I, I always wanted to look into the, the split but Ah you know, we know more than he does Gary uh, we're away in a hack well, we always like people who know a little bit less We've off the ball <laughs> Yes uh. <laughs> One nil for the amateurs Before we move on to uh, Daily Mount Park, which is the home of Irish football. Oh, we don't get we just we don't go anywhere near Daily Mount Park yeah. yet. No, no, no. We have to yeah. go down by 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 St. Luke's and Bertie. They go by the Bishop's Palace. With them, it's goodbye. Patrick O'Connell's house. Then we have to go by Crow Park. I mean, you're getting ahead of yourself there. But anyway, go can on. I well, can I ask you a question <laughs> about Tolka Park and Drumcondra specifically? Yeah, yeah, you might yeah. you might know the unanswerable question, and if you don't, it's okay. Drum, so I play for Drumcondra AFC. Yes, and there is a Drumcondra FC, and both of them claim to be. The original club oh, Lord. that played in Tolka Park. Mm. The one that we play for have the ticket for the Atletico Madrid game. Yes. The but the has... other but the other one have the original badge. So it's a it's a it's a major split at the minute in the drum contest. Oh, I don't know. I can't answer that question. <laughs> I know <laughs> I'd rather talk about the partition of the country than I'd rather than talk about the the, the soccer partition in Drum Contra. Like dr- drums were a big side in 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 the you know in the in the glory years of League of Ireland, Tucker Park would have been heaving with games between them and Rovers, um, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They kind of went into 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 uh, decline really in the 70s. They they no longer really existed, and then Tucker Park was was host to everybody. I can't. I know that there was an attempt to to to, to rejuvenate the name and to have John Condra out there in in Irish. Or Dublin soccer circles again, and that's been successful. Um, but the, we do touch on the, the, the demise of the League of Ireland from the 60s to the 80s, it really collapsed, and it was probably television, uh, probably the match, match of the day. All these players that you heard of that you only ever saw playing, you know, 
if they're playing international games, you never saw them playing. He's no way of seeing them play otherwise. And then all of a sudden they're on your television. And mm-hmm. so you didn't have to go down to Talker Park. Or, and, and, and people's kind of the way that they used to entertain themselves changed because, you know, there used to be so many picture houses around Dublin and they, you know, were no longer being used. And, you know, the the dance hall scene, uh, you know, that kind of faded away as well. So it wasn't just League of Ireland football. And you have to remember that the GEA may have maintained its its, uh, its, its big crowd phenomenon, but there's only a handful of games, a handful of championship games during the summer that would atta- uh, attract those crowds. So uh, that's interesting. But there was a, a famous game, you know, the League, the League of Ireland beat um, the English League, which at that time had the same status as being an international in 1962. Uh, and a guy who saved the penalty uh, was the uh, League of Ireland goalkeeper called uh, Sheila Darcy. Uh, known, I don't know why he was known as Sheila, but he later became the uh, manager of the Ireland women's soccer team. So we did have a, a, a manager of the Irish women's soccer team called Sheila Darcy. But <laughs> Sheila was a bloke. I didn't know that. There you so, go. <laughs> a long way to go to the Dalemount Park. I know time's getting against us, but um, do you want to take us through the, the route from... Yeah, well, we go, to... uh, we go around then. Um, we go around to, to St. Luke's and we talk about Liam Brady and Liam Brady, like because Bertie Hearn obviously would have been somebody very, in political circles, very at ease with being a soccer fan, a GA fan, which had been impossible at the early years to say as a state. So we talk about the fact that um, Douglas Hyde was president of Ireland, went to a soccer international in Daly Park in 1938 and then was stripped of his patronage of the GA. And then we talk about Liam Brady and Gary talks about, talks about Liam Brady. Uh, yeah, and what he was, to him. well, he was, you know, obviously he was very good at, uh, at, at, at football, both codes. Uh, and he was, I think he was selected to play for the Irish school boys in a match. And uh, he was also supposed to be playing uh, a GA match for his school in St. Aidan's in Whitehall. And, and he was told, you know, if you played in the soccer match that he would not really be welcome back at the school. Uh, so he played in the soccer match and he didn't go back to school. Obviously he went to, uh, to Arsenal and then to Italy <laughs> where, uh, where uh, he, he told me the story actually uh, uh, on about uh, what the Arsenal chairman at the time yeah. said to Brady. It's funny. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a big controversy by the way, when he, when he was effectively expelled from St. Aidan, but Bertie went to the same school. So that's, that's kind of the hook there. But um, yeah, he, he was leaving Arsenal to go to Italy and the, the chairman said to him, well, you know, Liam, there's no guarantee you're going to be a success in a foreign league. And I think this kind of, uh, you know, um, got the Christian brother education within Liam Brady a, li- a, bit, <laughs> a bit riled up when he said, I'm already playing in a foreign league. <laughs> it would have been more like, was well, so I'm already playing? <laughs> Bill. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, so, uh, yeah. So I think that whole the political interface between soccer and uh, and GA and what was kind of acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. It, you know, Bertie Hearn did change that. He was quite comfortable being a man, being seen as being a Manchester United fan, being a Dubs fan, uh, which would have been impossible the early years of the stage. So from then we go on to um, to my favourite story, which is about the uh, uh, the Archbishop uh, John Charles McRae when he tried to to stop a, a soccer international having just overthrown a government in 1951. He then decided to take on the FAI, which you think would be easier. But Gary, Gary tells that story as well. Well, they, they um, I think the first match is supposed to be in 1952 is against um, against Yugoslavia, uh, mm. and the the uh, there was such a, uh, an uproar about it, and uh, McQuaid managed to get the game, um, you know, banned, uh, cancelled. I think of the day, the cancelling of the day, and in 1955, then they reared its head again, and the the invitation was was uh, extended again to the Yugoslavian FA. They, and again, there was a huge to do about it, a huge uproar about it. And my understanding of it is is that is that uh, there was quite a few people even with an RT who wouldn't work on the game uh, because they were pretty much told by their local priest or the bishop, whatever, you know, that this was a mortal sin. And um, uh, and Philip Green, I think, or or legend has it, I'm not, I don't know whether this is true or not, but there was some suggestion that he didn't work on the game uh, because of because of the uh, of the issue but anyway the game did actually go ahead i think patrick Kavanagh, the poet um, amongst others uh, led a, a kind of an arts uh, delegation that they, they they protested and demonstrated and so on and encouraged people to go to the game uh, and the game did go ahead uh, i think uh, 22,000 people allegedly showed up most of them over a wall as far as i'm aware and uh, <laughs> a guy come on the tour yeah yeah a guy come on the tour. see we're all giving these statistics about um 
you know, about attendances and stuff. And the guy was there on the tour who'd been to all these matches back in the day and said, you have a camera just jumped over the wall. So you and your 22,000 <laughs> is irrelevant because, but I think it was the first indication that there was going to be a little bit of resistance to the power of the Catholic Church was this soccer <clears> game. And, you know, Yugoslavia were deemed as being communist and all the rest of them pagan. And, uh, 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 but if you think about 1955, this game was played in October, September 55, you have the all Ireland final in Crow Park, named after an archbishop, the Archbishop of Cashel throws in the ball, church and stage, official Ireland, totally, uh, you know, comfortable with the GEA spectacle. And meanwhile, the Archbishop of Dublin is trying to stop a soccer international. So it just kind of gives an indication of who were at the top table and who weren't. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we go around the corner. Yeah, then we go around the corner. Uh, and we go down to Patrick O'Connell's house, who's an, a fascinating guy who was a local guy who played for Manchester United in the from 1911 to 1919 and then became manager of Barcelona. Um, and his story is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, we can go into it a little bit, but there's actually a connection between uh, his that house where he was from, his time playing for Manchester United during World War One, um, the saving of uh, the finances of Barcelona and the killing of Leon Trotsky. I think you have to go on the tour and uh, if you're going to probably get the explanation of what happened there. I have to pay for it. That's, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a free it's tour. It's a free tour. Oh, is it? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> there is no cost. Um, but there, yeah. he. Went uh, nothing on, comes for free. Nothing comes yeah, for he free. Went on he went on a tour. Of, of, you have to pay with North, your time. Yeah, he went on a tour of North America in order <laughs> to play, pay with your time uh, and your sweat and your tears. And, uh, and the We're doing a here. sporting tour as yeah. a guy from off the border saying you pay with your time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like that that scene in fame you know <laughs> you want fame with fame costs and um, yeah, you see off the ball it's like it's, it's like it's like going to the high altar of off the ball it, it you is know? You know, sort it of is. like do they approve if they yeah. don't approve we're dead we're yeah, gone we're gonna you be know? slated after we'll this. be cancelled yeah well, I'm so- <laughs> <laughs> see, th- see, this is this is just one football podcast on on off the ball. It's Team Thirty Three, so we're right. we're sort of the we're the hipster side of uh, off the ball. If you and so, Team Thirty Two and Team Thirty One and all that. Is uh, it? No, and it comes. The name comes from the famous Delaney uh, Euro or was it the the World Cup? Um, the oh, France of course, right, of okay, okay. So, so that's where the name comes from. So, <laughs> I so, suppose if people want to go on this free walking tour. But we haven't they even will. told you about. We haven't even told you about. We'll, we'll give you one more before we go. Before like Daily Mount, you know, is a million stories. But the last mm-hmm. story we we'll tell you is we go up to where a guy called Tom uh, Farkinson used to live. Tom Farkinson was um was a goalkeeper, who was an IRA activist, and was uh, exiled to Wales because of his activity in the in the early twenties. And uh, he became a goalkeeper for Cardiff City, won an FA Cup in 1927 with Cardiff City, and he's the reason why goalkeepers stay on their line for penalties because when on the way to winning the FA Cup in 927 Tom Farkerson had a little kind of a, a way of rushing the kicker of the penalty every time the penalty was conceded um, as soon as the whistle was blown and he was so successful at this that they uh, they changed the rule because of him and he had a gun in his kit bag for all his career in case his IRA background came back to haunt him and he was selected to play for the IFA team in 1931 and told them that they weren't the, the legitimate Ireland so like we we picked up a lot of these stories along the way, and we go from there to to, to Daily Mount. And there's so many stories with Daily Mount and Liam Whelan and the Buzzy mm-hmm. Babes and and that famous game in '57 against England, and and all the more recent stuff about the, the the crowd issues and the game against Italy in '85, and why Daily Mount is no longer really an international venue, and what's going to happen into the future. But like, there's so many people who just tell their own little stories of uh, of the games they went to, and we really enjoy it. And uh, and Gary does his, his Eamon Dunphy and. Um, I'm very sure from other ah, you know, <laughs> you know, all in the best possible taste. Yeah, of course. yeah. So again, I suppose we'll finish off with Daily Mount Park, as and I know you have to get get going to do your actual job. Um, what about do what what's what do you how do you summarize Daily Mount Park because there's so much that has happened in it. Oh, I know, Gary. It's it's almost like a, it's. It's it's there's such a level of positivity about Daily Mount Park at the moment, what Bowes are doing uh, and and all that, but there's such history to it and just how it kind of it was the main international venue until the 70s and then the the you know the, the competitive games kind of drifted away. There's a great story of, of this 57 game against England when Ireland were one 0 up and Philip Green, who we mentioned earlier, he can still get on YouTube. He can't be heard over the roar of the crowd. 
And then a last minute equaliser go in, goes in by a guy called Johnny Atio. And the story is that you could hear the silence from O'Connell Street. Just this 45,000 roaring crowd, one nil up against England. And, then, uh, and Liam Whelan played in that game, one of only four internationals. He did play for Ireland and he was he was dead only a few years later. So t- there's all that kind of local history of local people who played in that stadium, uh, the great names like Pele and, and Zanadine Zidane and, and, and all the great occasions. And then it kind of, it, it, has, a, it has a future now because of the, the redevelopment and, uh, and all that. So it's, it's not a graveyard in any way, mm. but, you know, many of our, our stories and our, and our memories and our childhoods would, would, would be connected with that, with that ground, you know? And, uh, and Gary tells a story about being at the, at, at the, the, the Russia game in, in 74. Yes, indeed. Um, there were, I think there were more people standing on top of the stand than there were <laughs> in the terrace. Uh, it was one of those free-for-all uh, games. One of Ireland's great performances, you know, uh, and I had to put Don Gibbons. Apparently, Don Gibbons uh, had to get a, a, get home to London very quickly after the game. And he went out in his kind of mucky uh, gear and tracksuit and so on with the match ball and got, uh, hailed a taxi. And uh, taxi driver said, "Why are we at the game?" <laughs> the taxi driver was Brian Kerr. Huh? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, again, is that really true? But your look, does it matter? Does the truth matter? Mm. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it, we we also touch on how the ban went from the GEA, um, but like the ban is still in many people's heads. It's in many people's hearts. It's in many people's outlook on mm. on how sport is. It's it's a, it probably a generational thing. But like you still have people like pal of um, of Gary's who'll say that GEA is only, you know, no rules and 15 goalkeepers. And then you have people within the GEA that I would know haven't been at matches, the things that people say, you know, uh, if you want to boo, follow soccer. You hear, you know, and this idea that soccer is, you know, kind of English, it's professional, and the players have English accents when they're playing for Ireland, you know, it's partitions as well, that's the, the side whereas the GEA is a little bit more you know, purist and uh, an amateur and uh, and all that. So, but I think for most people, maybe younger than me, it, these are two games that, are, that you can love uh, equally. Uh, they're interchangeable. You can play them both. Um, but from a Dublin perspective, there is that class element that if you played soccer, you were a corner boy heading up to Damon Park. And um, that's, we, 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 we try to just investigate that. And it's, it's just really, really interesting. Mm. Yeah, well, in in the countryside, it's still kind of there. Having grown up in Donegal, it's, you you yeah. choose you choose if you're playing tour, football actually. or yeah, there was, soccer. There was a lad. I sorry to cut across you there, but there was a lad on the tour. I think it was in, I can't remember is it Tipperary or Offaly or some, somewhere, but he was saying where he was in school, he was told not the playing soccer was a bad idea because it would affect his ability to play hurling, uh, which I don't really believe. No. I'd say DJ Carey would be very good at anything he played. You I know? think Shane Long would have a, have a view on that. Saying <laughs> yeah. he, Shane Long played minor for Tipperary and uh, uh, went on to have a good... A good Niall, Niall Quinn. Niall Quinn, who was a, a, a minor on Ireland. Uh, he played in the minor All-Ireland final in 83 and then a few years later was scoring goals for Arsenal. So, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of... Ireland is a small country, but identity is very important to us. And, and football and sporting identity is... Uh, and and we still we still feel it. We still know it. Like if somebody plays a particular game, we pigeonhole that person in our heads as to who they are and where they're from, what their background is, and what school they went to. Uh, and we're not trying to make a judgment call over which game is better or or which you know. There's a, there's been a lot of things done over the years that have been um, have been good on both sides and maybe negative on both sides. But it's it's part of the the, the history of the state. And we don't have there isn't a football walking tour. Uh, in Dublin and we just don't want to go well this match happened here and this guy came from here and this person came from there it's more about sort of this is the country in which we live and and this is the tension that has been around and these are you know these are the stories that go with it yeah. uh, and we can only understand where we are now uh, in the development of sport in Ireland um, uh, if we're going to have to try and improve things into the future you know mm-hmm. Well, it sounds absolutely brilliant, and I, I promise I will get down and, and pay with my time and, and go on this. Uh, <laughs> well, we have to go footballwalking tour at gmail.com. Footballwalking tour at gmail.com. And just because they're free the doesn't mean you have, you know, you have a get out clause not to turn up. <laughs> All right. Just saying that there's a long waiting list of people who are doing things right and want to turn up. And if you don't turn up and don't tell us, I don't know. And by the way, everybody's welcome. It doesn't matter if you're a convicted terrorist or, you know, a serial killer or even a Shamrock Rovers fan. Like we're very non, non-judgmental. Well, footballwalkingtour at gmail.com is where you can book tickets or 
book your time to be yep. on the football walking tour with Gary Cook and Labour TD and Raider. And thanks very much for joining me today, lads. Hey,